Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 6 Maya Copa Sometime earlier It had now been a few days after running into Kent, Ash, and Samel back in Arizona. They had all run into each other during one of their recent supply runs. Spooked upon the death of their friend and family member Thomas, the team were contemplating leaving Arizona altogether. The large caravan were making their way south, their destination, Cartago, a stopping point before continuing on to their final objective. They had been recently inspired to travel this route by a robotic-like voice coming over one of the channels on their radio sets. The air was filled with a slight mix of cool and warm breezes. A mere mist of precipitation remained from the sporadic showers that the monsoons brought to Central America throughout the warm summer season. It was afternoon, but the sun was absent, replaced by a thick fog, darkening the skies, casting marching troops of shadows throughout the vacant wilderness. They were about 150 miles out now. They knew they could make it that far with the gas that they had from just recently fueling up. Planning on gassing up once more in Cartago, they would then continue on from there to meet Paco, the old family friend of Seth's, unaware of the depraved baggage this particular contact carried along with him. They were hoping that this friend would provide them with an alternate route, avoiding the dense jungles. It was about the halfway point when Beck noticed something ahead. Debris and overgrown vegetation meandered through the recently formed cracks of the asphalt they traveled. On it, still a little way out, sat a peculiar deserted vehicle. The desolate highways were typically home to abandoned cars. This particular one, however, seemed out of place. It was a dark, burgundy car, 
pulled off to the road's shoulder, as if an altercation had developed. Quite often, a car was simply parked, as people passing through would often run out of fuel, deeming the car disabled. This one, however, was pulled to the side with what appeared to be some items spilling out of the ajar driver's door. Do you see that? Beck said to her brother. Trevor, in the passenger seat of the old station wagon, looked ahead and saw a car pulled off to the side of the road. This wasn't odd, as they came across abandoned cars all the time. What was odd was that the driver's side door remained open with a body laying outside of it. With its feet still in the car, the figure appeared to have simply fallen right out of the vehicle and was left frozen in place on the warm asphalt. The group of three mismatched vehicles slowed as they approached the suspicious scene. They were not sure if this was the result of an amateur gang or possibly Russian or even cartel activity. All they knew is they had to be careful. Any one of these scenarios were just as deadly as the next. As they slowly moved past it, they noticed a woman sitting up in the passenger seat, appearing lifeless. Just beyond the bizarre encounter, Beck pulled her vehicle over. What on earth are you doing? Jack asked from the back seat. Beck looked back at him. I saw something move in the back seat, she said, while focusing her attention in her rearview mirror. Trevor interrupted the conversation. All the more reason to get the fuck away from it, and the fuck away from here. His sister just gave him an exhausted look, silently but effectively placing a blame of paranoia on him. It's fine. Nobody's around. What if it's a little puppy dog? You said we should get a guard dog, right? Trevor rolled his eyes. This isn't what he had in mind when he had originally recommended the canine idea. They got out of the car, Jack included, and began to walk back to the other vehicles in their group. They explained their delay as they continued on toward the metal glassy tomb. The rest of their group looked on as they watched the three cautiously approach the vehicle. Trevor's hand was on his gun. He kept tucked into the back of his belt. Seth, in the Hummer, kept a sharp eye out. He kept looking ahead and in his rear view mirrors. As the curious three came up to the car, they were joined by Eugene and Anne. As they made their way past the front seat, they noticed a needle on the ground next to the man laying outside. He was wearing jeans and a blue flannel shirt. The seat belt had kept him from falling all the way out. A light buzzing sound came from a few flies that had taken advantage of the free meal. The woman inside had a light drizzle of blood protruding from a corner of her partially open lips. She was younger looking, wore tattered clothes, and her eyelids were slightly open. Overdose, Eugene piped up. No one responded, except for Beck and Anne, who both had shocked expressions on their faces, with utter heartbreak coming from their eyes. Their jaws both dropped at the same time. They were not responding to Eugene, though. They were simply reacting to the two young toddlers, sitting, strapped in car seats, in the back. A boy and a girl, very close in age. Beck slowly approached the two youngsters, with Anne close behind her. What's your name, little one? The boy spoke up. Caleb, he said with a tone of certainty in his voice. The little girl put a tiny finger to her lips. Shh, mommy and daddy are sleeping. Beck smiled at the two in their car seats now in the back seat of their station wagon. Jack closed his door as he sat next to them. Beck returned her eyes to the road and slowly pulled away with two vehicles closely following. The nine travelers now became eleven as the receding car in their mirrors now sat completely lifeless. That evening, upon reaching Cartago, the group decided to stick with their plan on resting as they felt it would be dangerous to travel in the dark. After achieving their rest and fueling up the following day, they continued down the highway on the last leg of their trip and toward their final destination. Ash and Somel were sitting in the back of the Hummer as the three vehicles stuck closely together, the rusted down old station wagon leading the pack. Somel reached into his pocket and pulled out a tiny antique tape recorder. 
he sat lower in the bed to be less obvious. He then pulled out one of Jack's radios from one of the coolers. He held the recorder's speaker to the receiver of the radio. Simultaneously, he pushed down the side button of the radio and the play button on the recorder. A robotic voice came from the recorder. Repeating transmission. This is Zul. All networks back online. Properties are secure. Safe Harbor has been acquired. The recording then voiced several instructions regarding access codes and expirations, as well as reciting the precise GPS location of the supposed safe harbor. Both now satisfied with their ruse to keep the rest of the group heading deeper south, simply just smiled at one another. While sharing their nefarious schemes with the three, Paco and Kent, both sat on a couple of crates, facing Trevor and his two friends, Eugene and Seth. They were all in separate small new cages, just as Paco had promised them earlier. While sitting with their backs pressed upon the cold steel bars behind them, they held their knees up to their chests. The three of them held gazes at their two captors with pure resentment. The hard ground floor of the cramped steel enclosures only fueled their rage. The room they were in appeared to be some type of basement. It was darkly lit as only several kerosene oil-based lamps illuminated the atmosphere, casting dancing shadows along the interior walls. They could see a large steel table beyond Paco and Kent, gowned in a thin blue cloth that was obviously used for medical purposes. The work table next to it, however, held a much more sinister display as it was crowned with an assortment of crude antique medical devices. The most alarming of them all being a large, rusty amputation saw. Trevor, having gone through losing his grandfather to the vicious events that unfolded earlier, leading to the current development he now found himself in, was not letting the threatening surroundings faze him. He wanted blood, and he wasn't going to let his steely cell stop him. While looking at Palco, with a furious animosity in his scowl, he listened to his murderous adversary spew his diabolical narrative. While phasing in and out of the conversation, he took in a bit more of his surroundings. It was a small, square-like room. The walls were tan, and seemed to be made of a sandy-like brick material. There was a flight of stairs, curving around a corner, leading out of sight to the top of its dark extremity. The flooring wasn't completed upon construction of the building, as it was just hard, flat earth. The room was a blank canvas other than the freestanding medical tables and the caged hostages. You betrayed us, Eugene said as he looked at Kent. Kent? still wearing his black cargo pants and his white sleeveless shirt, gave a crooked grin to the speaking inmate. That's kind of the point. You were, after all, our property. And you too, he said, switching his stare to Seth and Trevor. She was just one girl. Why couldn't you let it go? Instead, you decided to take out an entire team of armed Russians but more importantly, our clients. Seth's eyes lit up as he looked at Kent. It was all coming together. It was you. Kent moved his gaze directly at Seth and cocked his head as if to be amused in curiosity. Seth continued letting accusations fly. You followed us. A smile slowly spread over Kent's face. And, Kent asked as if to invite Seth to further his investigation. He gestured with his hand, as if he knew what Seth was about to reveal. Seth looked at him with a malevolent glare. You killed my father. Kent let out a loud laugh and looked over at Paco, who was also bursting into shrieks of laughter himself. Kent looked back at Trevor, then to Eugene while his laughter faded slowly away. Then he peered back at Seth and looked deep into his eyes. You should never fall asleep on guard duty. He gave a sigh and a shake of his head in a disapproving manner and threw a wink at Seth. 
He appeared gleeful as he began telling his story. It was extremely dark and silent. The stars over the Sonoran Desert pulsated more than ever as they had been liberated from their former prison of the distorting lights of civilization. A sprawling ranch crept along a peaceful, vacant town, emulating a tranquility one would find hard to resist. Thomas was basking in the moonlight, laying on a slightly reclined garden chair. He clutched a large assault rifle, as it was his turn to keep watch. They usually did this in pairs, for safety reasons, but tonight he insisted everyone should get their rest. Besides, he loved being alone under the dark wilderness sky. It brought him a sense of normality he rarely felt these days. Everyone else, with the drama of the day, were easily persuaded to let him be. He was probably three quarters of the way through his shift. The events that took place earlier that day played on repeat within his head. As he stared into the skies, he felt a sense of serenity take a calming effect over his body. He began to drift while his eyes slowly closed. The flashes of the day still permeating his thoughts were slowly being muted by the stillness of the surrounding desert. Suddenly, whipping him into a frenzy of panic, his neck was quickly being strangled by the rigid, rough materials of a sisal-like rope, now tightly around the underneath of his jaw. Ash and Samael began to yank the other end of the rope. It was woven through a horizontal support beam of the awning's rooftop. Thomas let out muted grunts as his fingers went from holding his weapon to trying to loosen the tightening rope, now asphyxiating him. He tossed around like a rag doll as he was hoisted up into the air. He felt his face begin to burn with what felt like boiling blood, about to burst from his eye sockets. Through the blurred vision of his rapidly shattering capillaries, he saw a man with a handlebar mustache approach him. Kent looked up at him as he held a large serrated knife. You really need to stay more alert. These are dangerous times. With that, Kent made a swift, sweeping motion with his blade. Thomas let out a long, gasping sound of pure anguish as his mouth was opened wide in response to the assault. He could hear the splatters of what previously were the insides of his bowels hit the deck below. After seconds of sporadic tremors, his head fell along with his arms as his lifeless body swayed to the creaking sound that the rope and wood fixture made in unison. Just beyond him, in the open fields, three dark silhouettes dissolved into the night as the desert slowly retook its somber silence. Paco and Kent shook their heads in disbelief of the easy target. They looked at their caged audience, proud of their chilling recollections. So why didn't you just finish it? Trevor asked, with a tone in his voice that let his captors know he grew weary of their tales. Paco looked back at him. Santiago and Nicolas, brothers of the Chancellor, hired these men to acquire new assets not to have them ruined by the likes of you and your friends. So seeing that you guys had their stolen property, their jobs were clear. Trevor and his friends didn't understand. A look of confusion mixed with an intense growing anger swept over their faces. Kent leaned forward on his crate. He opened his arms wide to the three. Repossession of our property with interest. The three were silent in thought things weren't all adding up. Eugene broke the bewildered silence. Yeah, but why not just kidnap the entire group? Why kill Thomas? He paused and looked over at Seth, as if to apologize for the shallow remarks. That's why Kent is such a good asset to the Chancellor, Paco announced, always with his bright ideas. Kent picked up on his colleague's cue. We knew you just took out six Russians. We're not stupid. You see, when I was a boy, my father taught me how to hunt. He always told me, don't go after a fox. It will always out fox you instead. Let the fox come to you. Okay, okay, so you lured us here. 
We get that, Eugene said. That still doesn't explain Thomas. You could have lured him as well. Kent stared at Eugene. He rolled his eyes, sighed. He continued speaking, slightly louder, signaling to Eugene to shut up. His explanation wasn't done. Daddy also said, if the fox is sleeping, never breach his hole. Instead, upset the fox with him. Make him want to leave his hole. Leave it far behind. A smile grew over his face as the three prisoners realized their fates had been sealed once Beck's rescue mission was in motion. They didn't get away with anything. They were being watched, observed by the Chancellor's point man. And that point man didn't see a problem. He saw a bigger payload. But you were my dad's friend. How could you let this happen? Seth spoke up, addressing the casually dressed gangster sitting on the crate before him. He had hoped to appeal to Paco's better nature, if there was such a thing. Paco looked at Seth. That is where I am sorry, my friend. I was miles away, unaware of Kent's developments. It is, in your language, how you say, collateral damage. Once I saw Kent, his men, you and your buddies appear on the shore, I knew what had happened already. I was hoping to separate you from them, and maybe I have new recruit, eh? But then, you. Paco looked at Trevor. You had to go snooping around boat. No, this is unacceptable. Friendship too risky. If only I had my men keep a closer eye on Jack, eh? Paco laughed. Trevor. Now feeling overwhelmed by the realization that he was the hunted fox, looked at Paco. And the boat. How'd you get out? You were all in fucking cages. On the bottom fucking level. Paco and Kent shared glances and chuckled. Paco stood up and patted Kent on the back. He is so smart, this one. Kent looked up and smiled at his trading counterpart then looked back at the three, proud of his stealthy nature. He regaled the threesome. We never left you. We just felt it a better decision to trail you from behind. You know, just in case you and your friends tried something stupid. This time, we were going to see our parcel through. Security detail, if you will. So, before you departed from the dock, we quietly snuck back and used a life raft Pauco lowered for us. We were with you the entire time, being towed out of sight, right below the rear deck. Of course, when things went south, it took us some time to get on board. By time we made it to the top deck, well, you and your friends were already heading to shore. Not seeing Pauco or his men with you, we quickly made our way below, he said, painting a clear picture of what happened next. The vessel was filling up with water. The lower level was almost completely flooded. The compartment with the cages that once held the poor souls on the brink of death now held Palco and his men. It was at the far end of the ship that was still somewhat above water. Still, the room was rapidly filling as Paco began cursing aloud. You fucking pieces of shit. This isn't over. Paco screamed out the best he could. Suddenly, the door to their watery would be grave, opened, casting waves of filthy seawater around it. In walked a soaked and alert man followed by his two cohorts. It was Kent, Ash, and Samael. Paco, relieved to see them, but still angry about the events that just unfolded, yelled to the three. Cabrones, do something. Get us the fuck out of here. Kent smiled to his three captive men as he ended his history lesson. Of course, knowing how armed you all now were and recognizing your relentless skills, we decided to flank your position in order to dry out, regroup, and corner you on the beach the next day. But by then, we found your camp empty. 
that's when we got word from the Chancellor's compound of your daring invasion. That's also when we knew our task just became more complicated. Thankfully, you decided to take his plane. A plane that's equipped with a private GPS signal which we have access to. So we simply gathered another aerial vehicle and proceeded to track you down. And here we are. Trevor looked at Kent. And the GPS location? Kent smiled again. Actually, that was a real broadcast. We heard that thing for ourselves years ago. We even decided to check it out. Place is a dead end. Trevor realized the men never discovered the lab below. Kent continued. Knew it would put you on the Chancellor's shores, though. Now, Paco was standing at the table which held the medical devices, near the gowned operating table. With his back to everyone, Paco interrupted the history lesson. Time to get started, boys. The three caged men looked at each other, then back at Paco. Seth couldn't help but to feel at blame for his team's demise. He felt like he should have seen this coming. It was also him that trusted Paco in the first place. Sorry guys, this is completely my fault. I'm the reason we're here, he said to himself. He only wished he could tell them aloud. While looking over at Paco rummaging through the medical devices on the table, he couldn't shake the images of the five people he freed from the cages of Paco's yacht. What disgusting, horrifically painful events are about to take place in this dark, dingy basement. Are they about to become like one of those he had tried to save from the boat? Seth needed answers, as terrifying as they may be. What are you going to do to us? Paco answered, still facing away from them. We always try to recycle. Good for the environment, yes. Removing tracking devices from human flesh is easy. Just hack away. The human is already likely dead anyway, right? He said as he continued his horrifying words. Putting them into the flesh, the human alive, awake, twitching in sheer pain, much more tedious. Precision required. A steady hand is also good. Paco turned around and looked at the three. He held three very familiar looking GPS transmitters in his hands. They were each black, about a quarter inch thick, an inch wide, and about three inches long. Several wires dangled from them as he spoke. They each had blinking blue lights. By the way, the Chancellor wanted me to thank you for the GPS location of the five bodies you buried. A big smile grew over his entire face and his eyes lit up. These things are hard to come by these days, eh?
Chapter 7 Cultivation Trevor, Seth, and Eugene were now in the back of a truck. They were not sure what the truck looked like or who was driving it. All they knew is that they were in the back seats and the vehicle was in motion. They could barely make out blurs of light through what seemed like the car windows in front of them. The dark fabric of the hoods placed over the men's heads were thin enough to breathe through, but too thick to really make out any detail of their surroundings. They couldn't do anything about it either. Their hands were tightly bound behind their backs. They were constantly bumping into one another and being jostled up and down as the truck seemed to move quickly over some kind of bumpy terrain. They could hear from the front seats the chattering of two men. The conversation they were having was in Russian. Trevor was sure that Eugene sitting to his left and Seth sitting to his right felt the same intense pain that he did as his lower right hind calf was pulsating in agony. The surgery felt like it took forever. Now, embedded in his flesh was a GPS transmitter. He was sure that it blinked a blue light. After what seemed to be about 15 minutes or so, the truck began to slow. The blurs of light went completely away. Darkness was now enveloping their entire lines of sight. Suddenly the conversation became silent as the engine to the vehicle stopped. They listened as the two front doors sounded their squeaky hinges as they began to open. They heard the men get out and began to talk. Their voices as the conversation progressed became abruptly muffled upon the slamming of the two front doors. A moment went by while the muted conversation kept taking place. Then, the voices were heard coming closer to the back doors on either side of them. Both doors then opened, and Russian orders were barked at Eugene and Seth as they were sitting on the sides. Assuming the Russians were ordering them to vacate the vehicle the two turned out, put their feet down on dirt, and stood up. Trevor slid over and out of the vehicle to his right, following his best friend. He felt a bump on his shoulder and realized it was Eugene who had been escorted around the vehicle to be stood next to the other two prisoners. And just like that, their hoods were removed from their heads. Two Russian soldiers with assault rifles were standing in front of them. They were standing on a dirt driveway that was covered by a dilapidated wooden awning. The awning was attached to a small shack of a house. The three of them noticed the army-style jeep that they were riding in was now directly behind them. It was daylight out, however, quite shady under the awning. The skies were cluttered with storm-like clouds, and there was a slightly cold breeze in the air. The Russians began shouting and pushing the three with their weapons, signaling them to go in the Be house. Good, what? Now? Trevor thought to himself. Why don't they just kill us already? The voices got louder as the shoving became more forceful. I'll write already. Seth snapped back. Still bound at the hands, behind their backs, they entered the house single file. The door was hanging off the hinges and propped open, so entering was not a problem with their hands tied. As the three entered, they noticed a bare room with two bed frames. Each bed frame had a mattress on it. The mattresses didn't have any sheets or blankets. Instead, nicely folded in the corner of the room, under a large window, were about five or six dusty, tattered blankets. At the back of the room was a door that was closed, and to the side of them was a small kitchenette with a window that peered into the street. Inside the little kitchen was a stove and a fridge, although certainly not working. One of the soldiers walked over to the kitchen and opened a cabinet. As he spoke to them with sharp Russian words, he opened the cabinet, which was crammed full with various cans and packages of preserved food. He pointed to the closed door across the room, while speaking in Russian once more, gathering his three prisoners' attention. Then he pointed to a diagram posted on the fridge with magnets. The diagram appeared to be a layout of the house 
and a few blocks or so around it, there was a red line drawn around a big portion of neighborhoods that included the house inside of it. The soldier kept saying things in Russian that seemed to signal to the men not to breach the line. As he sternly spoke while moving his finger back and forth across the line, he kept on pointing inside the red line, then out again. Just then, he walked up to his hostages and pointed at Trevor's GPS transmitter as he barked a single word in his native language. At that time, he paused for a moment and looked at each of the confused men. Then he signaled to his partner. One by one, the other soldier cut them loose while the other one drew his weapon. Then he spoke another single word in Russian, but the three just stared in confusion. The Russian then repeated the same word, only louder while gesturing to a bed. Trevor sat down while Eugene and Seth followed his lead. Both of the Russians were now pointing their weapons at them. The one that was just barking orders stepped forward and lowered his weapon. He pulled out a piece of paper and read four words aloud from it in plain English to the three. The words came across with a thick Russian accent and were clumsily spaced out. Welcome to Open Pastor. Then, just like that, he placed the paper back in his pocket, turned and walked out of the house and back to his Jeep. His partner followed closely behind while watching the three hostages as he left. As if they were not confused enough, they listened as the car doors opened and closed. Then the engine started up and the sounds of a vehicle backing up met their ears. The Jeep sounded as if to stop, then changed gears as it sped away. Eugene got up and rushed to the window. He watched as the vehicle made a right turn and disappeared around a corner. Eugene turned around to Seth and Trevor, who were now also standing, staring at him. What the fuck? Open pasture? What the hell is this place? Where the hell is this place? Where the fuck is my wife? Trevor and Seth started looking around. Seth began looking under the beds and rifling through the blankets. Trevor went over to the closed door and opened it. A waft of stale, foul odor met his nose and made his gag reflexes go into overdrive. I think I know what Vanai means in Russian, Trevor stated, referring to a word recently used by one of their Russian captors. Seth and Eugene looked over at him and into the room behind. What once was a bathroom now appeared to be the centerpiece of some horror movie. The old bathroom had been converted into an outhouse-like compartment. There was a toilet still there, but it sat on a plank of wood, obviously over what used to be plumbing, now most likely replaced by a simple hole in the ground. The human waste, obviously still there from the house's most recent occupants. A grimy, rusted out, old sink was fixed to the wall and barely hanging off. Surprisingly, there were rolls of toilet paper in the corner, stacked next to the toilet. Jesus Christ! For the love of God, close it. Seth cried out. Trevor quickly accommodated the request. Just then they heard what sounded like laughing. They looked over at the thin window behind them, facing the street. At the very bottom left corner, there was a face. But as soon as they laid eyes on it, the face disappeared. The three of them bolted outside, Eugene leading them. A little Hispanic girl appearing to be about seven or eight years of age, wearing a little white and blue flowing dress, was running away from their house. Eugene was able to catch up with the mini intruder and grabbed her by the arm. As he did, both his friends from behind yelled for him to stop. The little girl, shocked, spun around and fell to the ground, slipping from Eugene's grip. You think this is funny? Eugene asked in a stern voice. The little girl, scared and on the verge of crying, picked herself back up, brushed the dirt off her dress, and proceeded to run across the street to meet up with some of her friends. That's right, go on, get out of here. Meanwhile, Seth and Trevor were walking up to him from behind. She's just a little girl, Eugene, Seth said in a gentle voice, trying to calm his friend down and catch his own breath at the same time. 
Eugene turned to him. We gotta get out of here. We gotta find the others. I need to find Anne. With that, Eugene began to run. Trevor and Seth followed him, begging him to come to his senses. Eugene, stop. We can't go too far. They'll know. Let's go back to the house. We can come up with a plan. They could see as they were chasing their friend. People began to watch as they all just stood in their places, not saying anything. The community of people and the buildings around them spoke of a poor third world country soaked in poverty. Eugene, please. Come on, brother. We'll figure it out. Just then, they heard beeping from their transmitters. Seth and Trevor stopped in a manner so fast, they had to put their arms out and catch their balance. They looked on in horror as Eugene kept going. They could hear the beeping on his transmitter pick up pace and frequency. Eugene, they each yelled. All of the sudden, Eugene collapsed and looked like he was having a seizure. Except, he wasn't. The transmitter must have an electrical shock mechanism in it for when designated borders are crossed. Trevor immediately began forming a game plan in his head. He could hear a much slower beeping from his and Seth's transmitter. If Eugene just now became too far and triggered the mechanism, maybe they could just walk up, barely to that line, grab their friend, and pull him back over the threshold. Then, he thought to himself, his shoes, they were just like rain boots, completely rubber. Stay behind me, I have an idea. Trevor looked over to Seth and commanded. Trevor got down to his knees and started to crawl toward Eugene, who was violently writhing in electrical pain, about 30 feet ahead, frothing at the mouth. Seth was now down on all fours as well, as he followed his friend. They slowly made their way across the invisible fence lines. The beeping on their transmitters were gradually increasing in frequency, matching the increased frequency of their racing heartbeats. As they neared their friend, they slowed immensely, as the threatening, now exceedingly rapid beeping warned them of a similar fate. Just a little bit further now, Trevor whispered to himself. He began to reach out to Eugene. He could almost touch him. He turned to Seth. As soon as I grab a hold of him, grab my feet and yank us out. Only my feet. He knew that once he grabbed onto Eugene, he would become a conduit, but Seth would be fine grabbing Trevor's rubber boots. He got to his belly and began to crawl, the beeping on his transmitter now practically matching Eugene's. He reached out his arm again and stretched as far as he possibly could without moving forward any further. Finally, he was able to reach his friend. He slapped his hand, not wanting to be shocked away, and firmly grabbed it. He began convulsing with electrical shock waves racing through his body. Then, almost immediately, he felt the ground slip from under his belly, up and past his face as he was being drugged backwards. Finally, the electrical shock faded from his body, leaving him tense throughout with a fierce taste of copper and blood in his mouth. He let go of Eugene's limp hand, looked up at Seth, who was looking at him in amazement. He gave Seth a thumbs up and threw him a large grin and then swiftly proceeded to pass out. Upon a few seconds of being unconscious and after being helped up, Trevor and Seth looked over at Eugene, who was still on the ground, seeming to be completely knocked out. The two knelt over their friend and from either side, they lifted him up from his underarms. They began to make their way back to their new hovel, noticing all the stares they were receiving from their new neighbors. The first night in their new house proved to be very dark, with only two windows on either side of the small one-room home. Only a tiny bit of moonlight crept in. They managed to force the front door closed, even though the upper hinge was completely dismantled. The clouds over the small, micromanaged community crisscrossed over the moon, causing the lights in their home to morph from one shape to the next. Trevor took one bed, while Seth insisted him and Eugene should have the comfort 
of at least a mattress for the evening as he slept between them on a blanket on the floor. Eugene was knocked out from exhaustion on the opposite bed. It was reasonably chilly that night. They had used all the blankets to make themselves their places to sleep. Seth used one in particular to give himself a buffer from the rotting hardwood floors. Seth continued to speak as him and Trevor were whispering their mere muted conversation. And they just stood there, Seth remarked. They were trying to keep their voices down as their friend Eugene recovered. It's the weirdest thing. It's like everyone is just okay with this. They all had transmitters like us. Trevor replied, who knows where their red lines are. Some of us have to share some of the same areas. We were passing right through groups of people. Seth kept thinking of the weird way everyone was just staring at them. No one coming to their aid. It's just weird here. We gotta figure a way to get out. Trevor rolled to his side and checked on his recovering friend across from him. He saw the blanket slowly heave up and down. Then he looked down at Seth. Once there's more light, I'm sure we'll come up with something. Eventually the two began to drift off to sleep. Trevor sat up quickly. It was daylight now, as the sun shone through the windows. He looked down and noticed that Seth was not there. He began to stretch as he woke himself up. Then, looking across the room, he saw that Eugene wasn't there either. His heart began to race, but his mind told him to stay calm. Everything is probably fine. They're most likely just right outside. Just then, a loud knocking from the door startled him. He sprung to his feet and walked over to it. He saw a blurry, dark figure far off into the distance. His eyes were still adjusting to the bright sun. As he walked out through the covered parking area, he noticed the figure was facing away from him. Slowly, it turned around toward him, and as it did so, he noticed it had Eugene by the throat. Even from the great distance away, he heard Eugene screaming. Trevor sat up quickly again. He was back in bed, and it was no longer daylight. It was pitch dark. It soon dawned on him that he had just awoken from a dream. He looked down at Seth, who was still sleeping on the floor. Then he heard a voice off in the distance. It sounded like Eugene, and it echoed of his dream he had just woken up from. He immediately looked over to the bed across from him. Eugene was gone, and then he realized that the door was open, once again, leaning against the interior wall, clutching on by its bottom hinge. He heard another shout from off in the distance. It was definitely Eugene. Seth, he shouted in a whisper. He didn't know why, he whispered, just habit from being in a dark, sleepy room, having just woken up. Seth, he said again, this time in a louder voice. Seth sat up and turned to Trevor. Trevor gestured to Eugene's bed. Seth looked over and then back at Trevor. This time, they both heard it. Eugene was screaming outside, way off in the distance. They both scrambled to their feet and ran outside where they could hear Eugene more clearly now. As they ran towards his voice, they began to see him come into focus. They slowed down, remembering the event from earlier. They approached him, cautiously listening for their transmitters. Come get me, you stupid motherfuckers, Eugene shouted. They were close enough now, they could hear the beeping from Eugene's leg. They were also close enough to whisper to him. Seth tried to calm their friend. Eugene, come on, let's get out of here. Eugene looked over at the two. I'm gonna wait till those stupid fucking Russians come and get me. Then I'm gonna make them eat their own fucking guns. Then he turned his gaze from his friends back to the wind and continued shouting. Come on, you pussies. Come get some. Trevor noticed car lights off in the distance approaching them. He thought he'd take a shot at convincing his friend to come with them. Come on, Eugene. You know we can figure this out. This isn't the way. Eugene looked at Trevor with sad eyes. Where's Anne? I want my Anne. 
Trevor sighed and looked at the car lights getting closer. I know. I want my sister back too. And Delilah. And Caleb. But I'm telling you, brother, this isn't the way. Let's get back inside before they get here. Eugene paused. A slow expression of logic washed over his face. Trevor and Seth indulged in a temporary rush of relief as Trevor held out his hand. Come on, man. Let's figure this shit out together. Without them. Again, Trevor gestured to the incoming hazard. Eugene's facial expression changed. His eyes lit up. No, I'm gonna get my wife. Right now, he said to the two of them. He looked up at the approaching headlights, now only about 500 feet away. Over here, you assholes. Trevor and Seth's faces dropped. A jeep came to a slow rolling stop. With headlights flooding the three, they all shielded their eyes, unable to see beyond them. The sound of a car door opening cued Eugene to taunt the Russians even more. Take me to my wife, motherfuckers. Just then, a shot fired from beyond the lights. Eugene fell screaming to the ground, holding his leg. It was a warning shot. Trevor and Seth, unable to assist their friend without escalating the situation, just stood back in shock, both with their hands on their heads in a stressed posture. Eugene was now on his knees, sobbing, as two Russian soldiers approached. They were both holding their assault rifles. Once they got up to him, one of them grabbed Eugene by the scalp and yanked him up to a standing position. The other soldier walked back to his car. He pulled out a megaphone and began to make an announcement in Russian to the rest of the neighborhood. Trevor and Seth were unsure what was being said, but they had an idea. They noticed everyone come out from their shacks. One by one, they all lined up. It almost appeared as though they had practiced this before. They couldn't see everyone because of how dark it was, but in the close vicinity, there were at least a few dozen people. Men, women, and children. The Russian calmly placed the megaphone back in his Jeep and pulled out a small handgun. He walked up to Eugene, who was crying and begging to see his wife. He slowly raised the gun to Eugene's head and began to look around at the small crowd. He ensured everyone was paying attention. Then, without even saying anything to Eugene or anyone else, he pulled the trigger, letting his gun make a pop that echoed through the community. The bullet went through Eugene's head and out the other end, spraying blood and brain matter across the beaming lights of the soldier's vehicle. The man clutching Eugene's scalp let him go as Eugene's lifeless body promptly crumbled to the cold, sandy ground. The two soldiers looked at Trevor and Seth, who had now dropped to their knees, still clutching their heads in trepidation. Satisfied with the example they made of their friend, they quickly spun around back toward their vehicle and climbed back in. As they drove off, the headlights slowly began to show Trevor and Seth the multitudes of residents watching the drama. They were lined up at their designated red line limits as they then faded out of sight as the car made a full U-turn and headed back from where it had come.
Chapter 8 Retribution It had been five days now since they lost their good friend. Seth and Trevor were still shaken up. They weren't ready to give up on their other missing friends, though. They were scouting the best they could while trying to maintain a low profile. It was bright and sunny out, with a few clouds off into the distance. The two were sitting against the house, talking. They kept their voices down, so no one could hear them. They had yet to come across anyone who spoke a word of English. Still, they didn't want to take any chances. If someone were to somehow understand them, the sick way these people walked around like Russian lapdogs had them pretty freaked out about those consequences. Okay, this one, Trevor said without looking up, maintaining an inconspicuous behavior. Seth peeked from the corner of his eye. Way up the road, he saw a golf cart pulling a small storage trailer. Yeah, I see it. She's like a maid. Right, I've seen her deliver blankets and shit. Toilet paper too. Trevor nodded, acting as though they were just having your average everyday casual conversation. Yeah, that's the one. Seth hesitated. You sure, man? She's just like a housekeeper. Why would she carry a knife? Trevor responded quietly. I have no idea, man. I just know I saw it. While she was working a few homes down, just outside the red line, I saw a glimmer from the blade. Look, Seth, we looked everywhere we could without raising suspicion. We found nothing, nothing without contracting fucking tetanus. But we get something sharp enough and something long enough. We can at least try to cut these things out. He paused for a moment as they both grimaced over the unavoidable second painful surgery. Then, breaking one of his rules to review an important detail by looking up toward their target, he narrowed down a few points of interest to his buddy. She does four houses on this path each day, and she's been getting closer. See, she's doing that one now, then that one, then that one over there, and then ours. I'd say she'd be here in about 12 minutes. They both look down. She keeps it in her back pocket. Seth looked over at Trevor. So, I distract her. When I accidentally drop the toilet paper she hands me. Then you bump into her backside. Sound right? Trevor nodded. That's the plan. That was when they both slowly stood up and headed inside. After a few minutes had gone by, they were sitting on the beds across from each other, trying to shake their nerves. I still can't believe how docile everyone is around here. Trevor complained. Seth shook his head in disbelief. Seems as though they're all drugged. Everybody's just living their lives like everything's normal. Shit ain't normal here. What do you think the end game is with these assholes? Joe was telling us that the clients the Russians work for terrify even them. Paco doesn't even seem to have a clue what he's involved in. And the Chancellor seems like he's pressed to meet their deadlines. Who the fuck do they work for? Suddenly they heard screaming. They ran out to see the same little girl that had an altercation with their late cohort. Two Russians were pulling her away from her crying mother. Seth lunged forward out of human instinct, but Trevor stopped him. They didn't even have to look at each other or speak. Trevor was right. Any attempts to rescue the child would just prove fatal for both them and the little girl. They watched as the Russians put the little girl in the back of one of their jeeps, along with other children rounded up from the community. They stepped back into their vehicle and while closing the doors sped off. This place is fucked, Seth said under his breath. She's coming. Quick, Trevor whispered. Seth looked over to see the housekeeper pulling up in her cart. They tried the best they could to look casual as they avoided excitedly looking her way and calmly strolled into their enclosure. Within seconds, a pretty young Hispanic woman 
with long brown hair, walked in after them. She didn't look like your typical maid. No uniform. No name tag. Just a designated resident, given a job by her jailers. She wore dirty, ripped jeans and a white, long-sleeved t-shirt. Seth watched as she passed. Sure enough, Trevor was right again. In her back left pocket, barely peeking out, was a black pocket knife as she carried a stack of blankets accompanied by two rolls of toilet paper. She placed them on the bed nearest the door, while Trevor and Seth exchanged frustrated glances. Before they could execute their plan, and instead of her handing them the items she once held, a strategic part of their plan, she quickly turned around and ran to the window. They both looked at each other, completely at a loss. The maid carefully checked the entire area, seen from the kitchen window that looked to the street and then turned around to face the two. She reached both hands into both her front pockets and pulled out a pen and a paper and spoke to the befuddled pair with her thick Hispanic accent. Do read, you write, and I take back. Trevor and Seth, still extremely caught off guard and confused, both moved in towards her. Trevor snatched the paper from her hand while giving her his best what-the-fuck look he could muster. They both read the paper. Scribbled on it were a few words in some very familiar handwriting as Beck's voice sounded in their ears. Wait for my signal, tonight. Three taps. You ladies ready to get the fuck out of here? It was just outside the all-too-familiar building. It wasn't too long ago. She was near this complex with her friends, scoping it out, attempting to achieve a safe pathway to their destination. Being back in front of it now, though, hands bound and being ordered around like a slave was extremely unnerving. The partial cover of clouds in the sky were not enough to block the piercing sun, which caused her to squint her eyes. As she was escorted down the capital steps of Esmeralda, she saw just outside the gates, a bus full of other folks, appearing to be just as frightened from her scattered sights, and while being pushed towards the bus, she assumed was for her. She noticed something. It appeared that the passengers all had their hands up. It didn't look right. It looked odd. It was as if they were all praying, their hands all folded, raised over their heads. The guard kept pushing her, speaking Russian, as they closed in on the impending nightmare with their hostage newcomer. It was Anne. It was a small school bus, still mostly yellow on the outside, but rusted and peeling in several spots. She was finally forced to the open door and made her way up the first couple of steps of the shuttle. Still being barked at in Russian by the soldier behind her, Anne was able to now peer in and absorb the alarming view within. She was crying and trying to appeal to the man pushing her up the stairs. She kept asking about Beck and Caleb and Delilah. She asked where her husband Eugene was, saying his name several times over. All the responses that kept being shouted back to her were just in Russian, sometimes loudly interrupting her teary efforts. She kept repeating their names. She wondered where they were, or why had she been separated from them. Finally, at the top of the stairs, she looked around, being forced to proceed down the center between the other passengers. The driver was another Russian soldier, who just patiently waited for his last fare to board and take her seat. The seats inside were made of a brown, leathery material and were completely torn and scratched up. She noticed as she made her way down the aisle, everyone was bound just like her. They all seemed to be older people, similar in age as herself, but no one appearing to be much younger. She didn't really pay much attention to this detail, however, as she noticed the more chillingly eerie sight that made her skin crawl and her blood turn cold. There were dull hooks hanging over all their heads, each one of the riders had their bounds hefted over the hooks that had given them the prayer-like posture she noticed from outside. They were all quiet, much quieter than her anyway. 
as she still let out pleas and cries. The shouting soldier followed closely behind. They sat in the seats next to each other, two by two, docile yet petrified. Each one of the windows, as she passed by them, were positioned completely open. This was likely to remove the foul aroma of a dozen or so people cramped together, appearing to not have seen a shower in a number of years. Eventually, she came to an open seat, next to a man who seemed to be no older than 50. He wore raggedy cut-off jeans and a yellow sleeveless shirt with a pair of sandals. He also had his hands bound, which were hanging on the hook above him, his arms raised high over his head. He also wore a seatbelt, but she noticed there was no visible buckle. The Russian hung his assault rifle on his shoulder and swung it around his neck as it came to a rest on his back. He stepped in front of Anne, who was looking at what she thought would be her seat for the unforeseeable future. He grabbed her by the wrists and hefted her bounds above the hanging piece of metal until it fell into place within the cradle of the hook as her arms stretched uncomfortably above her head. Sidit. Sidi сейчас. He ordered in Russian. She assumed he was telling her to sit down. Her eyes closed, flushed with salty tears. She hesitated and pleaded once more, letting out a pathetic whimper. Sidit. The Russian yelled once more, obviously ignoring her solicitation. Сиди сейчас. Anne finally caved and promptly took a seat. The Russian knelt at her side and began fussing with the seatbelt on her other side. He swung it around and swiftly pulled it through the underneath of the backrest, jarring her waist back into the seat. She heard him fussing with it a bit more as metal clanking noises began to sound. And then, finally, the unsettling sound of it clicking into place. She was now locked into position like the others, her torso completely stretched to the limits, unable to move her bound hands or loosen her belted waist. She began desperately crying out as the Russian made his way back to the front of the bus. Please, don't do this. Please stop. Where's my husband? Where's Eugene? She continued to bellow. The attempt for sympathy was completely unheeded by her Russian detainer as she managed to plead another question. Where are you taking me? The Russian froze. It was almost as if he understood the last question she desperately cried. This development made her calm down slightly, but in an uneasy manner. Was he angry with her? Did she push him too far? Was she being too disorderly? What measures of discipline might he usher back her way? She noticed the driver watching her in the large rearview mirror. He just shook his head and started up the vehicle. The Russian, who froze at her last inquiry, turned around and briskly walked up to her as she gripped the cold metal hook above her head in fear. He then leaned down to her level and said one word. It was an English word. A word he seemed to have recited for just such an occasion. With a lowered voice and a thick Russian accent, he finally obliged her latest inquiry. Fidlat. Did he just say Fidlat? What on earth could that mean? She wondered as the bus slowly departed. Anne watched through her blurry, damp vision, onset by the wetness of salty tears as the capital of Esmeralda became smaller and smaller. Meanwhile, back in Trevor and Seth's new neighborhood, the two men were standing in their little run-down shack of a home. The maid patiently waited as Trevor knelt on the ground, gripping a pen, thinking of something to write on the piece of paper laying in front of him. Seth, a hand on Trevor's back, looked on anxiously, awaiting the author's words to appear. Trevor began to write, understood. Tonight, we will be standing by. Trevor, still kneeling, looked up at Seth, who blinked and nodded, signaling a positive review of the short novel. He then changed his glance to the impatient, rightfully paranoid maid, who had shifting eyes darting amongst her surroundings. Cued by her growing sense of urgency, Trevor quickly handed her the letter. She hastily grabbed it 
beckoned for her pen and placed the contraband back into her pockets. The maid then did an immediate about face and expeditiously vacated the residence, her knife still in her back pocket. Very perplexed and somewhat humbled by the rescue's announcement, Trevor and Seth nervously smiled at each other. Well, that answers a lot of questions. They're still close by, at least Beck is, anyway. Seth stated in a hushed tone. Trevor was deep in thought and looked at Seth, not afraid to dramatize his puzzled expression. How on earth is she gonna get to us? How the hell did she find us in the first place? Immediately, they both terminated the conversation as they heard a car come screeching to a stop just outside. They ran to the window facing the road. A Jeep was there. Shit, had they been caught? Two men stepped out of the vehicle in familiar military uniforms. The driver stayed put just outside his door, armed with the typical assault rifle they all seemed to carry. The other one, unarmed, at least for now, opened the back door of the car and gestured for the occupant to disembark. With that, Trevor and Seth saw a young female get out, possibly in her early twenties. She was dark-skinned, looked like possibly a previous local of the town, and had long black hair. She wore loose-fitting black pants and a dirty light pink tank top. The unarmed officer didn't shy away from being rough with the young lady as he ushered her to the covered carport attached to their home. Trevor and Seth looked at each other with more confusion than before as they backed away from the window. They were now standing in the middle of the room as they moved their sights to the incoming sounds of footsteps approaching their battered doorway. Soon, a woman who had a tired face entered the room, followed by her aggressor. The Russian looked at the two men, grabbed the woman by the arms, and without caring for her comfort, pushed her up against a wall near the first bed frame, like a police officer would do in an arrest. After face planting into the wall, she turned her head and observed her environment through the corner of her eyes. The Russian, while forcefully holding her, looked at the two men and started speaking Russian. He wasn't yelling or shouting or even barking orders. It was as though he was simply having a conversation with them. To both Trevor and Seth's shock, the soldier then let go of her, grabbed her jeans, and yanked them down along with her underwear. Her removed clothes dropped around her ankles, revealing a transmitter that seemed to be a major fashion in the community. This time, something was different. It was ever so slightly different, but seemed to scream out to them. There was no blinking blue light. She stood there, not seeming to be shocked by the sexual assault that she just endured, and just stayed still. The Russian then pulled out an electronic-looking wand-like object from a cargo pocket off his right leg and waved it over the woman's transmitter. Three loud electronic beeps sounded from her device and a familiar blue light began to blink. This detail must have been something Trevor and Seth missed when they had arrived, most likely due to the fact that they were hooded at the time. The soldier then gestured to her exposed rear end and said a few more things in Russian. He slapped her exposed behind, causing her to grimace, looked at the bewildered pair, and smiled as if proud of the prize he was offering them. Then, just as he arrived, he regained a rigid face, gave them a stern look, and walked out of their home. The two just looked at the half-naked, heavily breathing woman, aghast at what they had just witnessed. She stayed put, eyes open, and paying close attention to them still viewing them through a side angle, her face still mostly positioned away. The three observed a moment in stillness as the sound of the Russian vehicle made its departure. Seth ran up to the woman and grabbed her pants to pull them up. With that, she aggressively took over and took upon the personal task herself. Abashed, she faced the two and walked in between them to sit on the bed. She put her head in her hands and let out a long, exasperated sigh as she slightly wept. Trevor looked over at Seth and mouthed a few words. What. The fuck. The cabin was dark, later that night, as Seth and Trevor sat on the floor, 
leaning against the bed frame nearest the door. Planning for their friend's arrival, the two had already prepared the door as it lay against the wall, hanging by only one lower hinge. They watched their new roommate as she lay on the bed opposite them, facing away. This new development had them at odds. They knew that Beck was planning on something tonight, and they didn't know if they could trust this newcomer to tag along, so they were wary to wake her. If she doesn't hear the signal, we shouldn't try to wake her up either, Seth whispered, continuing the conversation they'd been having. Trevor agreed. And if she does, he said, sweeping in a moment of reticence. They both thought for a while, then Seth broke the lull with the best rebuttal he could muster. Take her with us? Trevor put his head between his legs and drug his fingers through his hair. God, why now? Why tonight? Shh, Seth softly sounded. They both looked up at the sleeping female stranger as she tossed in her sleep suddenly. They sat on edge and looked on as they watched. Then to their relief, the young woman fell back into her previous sleepy patterns as they both let out nearly muted sighs. What do you think she meant? Seth asked. Trevor looked over at Seth and gave a slightly confused stare. Seth continued his line of inquiry. Three taps. A look of understanding came to Trevor's face as he considered the question. On the window? He answered. They both looked at the small window to the back of the house, where the stacks of blankets had previously been neatly folded upon their arrival. How is she not gonna get caught? Seth said, continuing to try to understand Beck through the mind of her brother. Trevor, having had the same question rattling around in his head for half the day, didn't have any good answers. Who knows? Maybe she hasn't had the procedure yet. Maybe she made her escape early and they can't track her. Seth shrugged. It was about as good of an answer he could get with the little information the two had on hand. They sat there in silence as the two watched the shadows in the room shift across the floor, obedient to its lunar conductor, orchestrating the shady waltz from above. They wondered if Beck was going to be able to come through. They worried for her safety wherever she might be. Just then, they heard a small tap. They froze in place, only able to hear the sounds of their own breath and heartbeats. They waited, anticipating and hoping to hear two more light taps. And as if that had spurred the next thing to take place, they heard it. Another soft tap. This time, not caught off guard and listening to find the location of the expected but still strange noise. They noticed it was coming from the wall near the bathroom. Suddenly, and hopefully not from the slight disturbance, their bunkmate began to jostle once again, letting out a few snores in her sleep. They focused on the blanket, heaving slightly up and down, covering the unconscious young girl as they watched her return to her routine slumber. Then, one last time, another small tap against the wall drew their eyes up and over. They both looked at each other and softly rose to their feet. They began to walk outside while their hearts began to race, warning them of the madness of their plan. After seeing the demise of their close compadre, they didn't want to amount to another example of what becomes of rebellious behavior for the surrounding community. As they peered outside, they cautiously made their way through the covered awning. They soon began to feel the vulnerability they were being submersed in as the moonlight illuminated the two conspirators. Knowing that the sound had come from the other side of their hostel, they gradually made their way around the back. They made sure to stay down while staying close to the dilapidated house, as they rounded the last corner before coming to the same wall where they heard the sound originate from inside. You see her? Trevor whispered, trying to stay calm and quiet, hoping not to alarm anyone. Seth looked around, his eyes almost fully adjusted to the distant dark shadows of wilderness that sat behind their domicile. He noticed a fence. Nothing too extreme. Just an old wire, property fence, probably built with the shack many years prior. Beyond the fence, the earth began to descend into a wash full of vegetation. The reasonably sized cove 
through cascades of dark, dense shadows throughout the riverbed. He continued to scan the area when something caught his eye. There, Seth whispered, the two still by their designated living quarters. Trevor immediately looked to where his friend was pointing and noticed a small hand waving at them, just on the other side of the weak barricade. It was Beck, and she was looking right at them, maybe 30 to 40 feet away, summoning them to her location. The two quickly looked around, scoping out their environment, assuring themselves they hadn't alarmed anyone to their covert mischief. Convinced they were, to this point, undetected, they began to run to Beck while maintaining hunched over postures. They eventually felt comfortable as they arrived in a blanket of darkness provided by the tall surrounding fauna. They were finally reunited with their rescue-wielding teammate. Trevor grabbed his sister, palming her face in his hands by her cheekbones, and gave her a kiss on her forehead through the openings of the wire fence. How? her brother demanded in a gleefully hushed tone. Beck looked at Trevor, reached behind her, and pulled an object out of her pocket. She brandished a very familiar item the two of them had recently laid their eyes on earlier that day. It was the electronic wand the Russian used to activate the woman's transmitter in their house just hours ago. Beck smiled at them. Ever see one of these bad boys? Trevor and Seth rolled their eyes, whilst smiling and shaking their heads in sheer disbelief at her ingenuity and resourcefulness. Wait a minute. Where's Eugene? Beck quietly asked, with a desperate urgency to quicken the mission at hand. Trevor and Seth, feeling an immediate punch to the gut, shared a momentary glance, and then both gave Beck a look that told her everything she needed to know. Her face fell, and her eyes grew a sadness that expressed both sorrow and anger for her abrupt loss, as well as an apologetic tone for theirs. As if to have a period of calm for the fallen, but keeping it to only seconds long, knowing there would be time to grieve later, they proceeded with their task. They immediately lifted both their right pant legs, exposing their transmitters. Taking their cues, Beck got to work right away. She proceeded to wave the wand over her brother's transmitter first. Just as expected, three loud electronic beeps instantly sounded, alerting the three to the disturbance they were making. They all looked around and stayed quiet for a moment. Nothing. Beck then proceeded to do the same for their friend, as she waved the wand over his extended hind right leg. Again, three loud beeps, and again, they quieted, looking about, scoping their surroundings for anyone catching on to the three schemers. When they were convinced that all was well, Trevor and Seth raised the top wire of the fence, while Beck held down the lower wire. The two made their way through the thin barrier, Seth going first and Trevor close after. Once the three were officially rejoined, they all made their way deeper into the dark thicket of the wash, moving quietly while maintaining a sense of urgency. As they trekked the muddy, grassy wash, they debriefed one another of everything that had happened, maintaining a muteness to their conversation, being sure to execute stealth. Trevor and Seth explained what had happened to Eugene, and also described the bizarre occurrence that had happened earlier that day with the female stranger. The bizarre story struck a personal nerve with Beck and made her feel momentarily sick to her stomach. She, on the other hand, didn't have any helpful suggestions of the whereabouts of the two children or even Anne. She explained that when they were separated on the plains, outside the underground lab, that she was bound, gagged, and blindfolded, just like the others. She continued to explain, to their dismay, that it was the last she saw of the missing three. It was clear to the both of them that she wasn't happy not knowing the fate of her adopted twins. Sure, she was worried about Anne too, but she emphasized her anger at the lack of knowing where Caleb and Delilah might be. As she continued to divulge her bad news, upon Trevor and Seth's inquiries, she began to explain her lucking upon the electronic wand she came equipped with. The beginning of her story 
sent the two into the memories of their own familiar and recent pasts. She was being transported in a truck, seated at the driver's side rear. Two other women sat to the right of her. All three had hoods over their faces and their hands tied behind their backs. Later, outside the vehicle, just like Seth and Trevor, the hoods were removed. One of the Russians became completely occupied with a conversation over his radio. The other stood guard over the three. They were all standing outside of a dilapidated structure when Beck noticed something. Another Jeep sped by them, also carrying three passengers in the back. She watched as it made its way up the road before disappearing into a darkened covering way off in the distance, provided by an awning attached to a house. She had a suspicious feeling the Jeep was occupied with at least one or more of her friends. How many hostages could they possibly house in one day? Over the course of the next few days, she watched a slew of weird happenings unfold around her. In one of these instances, Russian soldiers raided their home she had shared with the other two women. They grabbed one of the girls by the scalp and drug her out of the house, ordering her to walk to their car. She watched through a window as they stopped the girl for a brief moment. One of them pulled a wand from their pants pocket and waved it over the girl's transmitter. Then he put it back and pushed the female inside the car. Then the two soldiers got in and they drove off. She witnessed this occur a few more times in houses nearby. She also described something they had seen as well. Children being thrust into a car, ripped from their homes before being transported away. But she saw something they hadn't seen. The next day, she saw a child this time being dropped off to one of the same homes. After a couple days, the inevitable occurred. A Russian barged in and took her away. But Beck had a plan. Once in the Jeep, her hands tied behind her back, but with her transmitter disabled, she wondered where she was going. She paid close attention to her surroundings as she charted the area, keeping in mind where she thought her friends had been taken a few days ago. Not long after they started driving, she noticed the wand was sitting on the console between the two men. This may be easier than she thought. She noticed it vibrate away and began to think quickly. She waited for the most opportune moment as the vehicle hit rough terrain and made her move. She quickly bumped the device with her knee and caught it with her feet. She then slowly crawled the device up one of her pant legs. The car slowed as it turned up a driveway. The man in the passenger seat pointed to the house while speaking to the driver. Then they both stepped out and the front passenger came around to her door. He opened it, grabbed her by the arm and roughly pulled her out. He began to escort her up to a house she assumed would be her new temporary dwelling. She had to get rid of the evidence. She assumed he would eventually reactivate her transmitter, soon realizing the absence of his wand. She had to think quickly. She dove out of his grip and ran to a muddy, grassy area nearby, all the while, the Russian yelling. While her back was turned to him, she came to a sliding stop while falling to her knees. She leaned over and began to heave. While pretending to spew her guts all over the mud, she allowed the wand to slip from her pants and onto the ground where she forced it into the wet soil with her knee, all the while maintaining the charade of simply needing to throw up. She now heard the two soldiers laughing at her and speaking to one another, likely mocking their hostage. Satisfied with her impromptu assignment, she gathered herself up, turned, and walked back to her counterparts. As she approached them, they became serious and began yelling at her as one of them grabbed her by the neck and forced her into the house. She was greeted by the sight of a Hispanic man around her age, or slightly younger. He seemed to be an indentured community member as well. He was kind of chunky, very dirty, and not exactly in line to win any upcoming beauty pageants. Then, for some reason, to her shock, the strange man began loosening his belt. She felt very uncomfortable by it, and felt it to be very odd and out of place. She could hear her detainer rummaging through his pockets. 
She knew what he was looking for as her heart began to pound and butterflies filled her stomach. Eventually, he shouted to his partner, who moments later came through the door. They exchanged words in Russian, likely trying to figure out what's become of the missing wand. The newly arrived soldier forced Beck up against the wall and began to pat her down. Not able to find the missing item, he said some words in his language, appearing to be disappointed in his partner's lack of responsibility in the matter. Then he reached into his own pocket and pulled out a wand of his own and proceeded to reactivate her transmitter. After that, he left and headed back out to his car. After being admonished, the remaining soldier took hold of Beck and slammed her on the bed. She could see the new stranger waiting patiently in the corner of the room. The bed was under a window that was shattered, and there was glass covering the window seal. She began to panic as her worst nightmare gradually began to unfold. Her aggressor began violently removing her pants. She responded by putting up a fight, but with her hands still bound, her attempt was immediately subdued with a gun now held to her head. He continued to undress her, completely ripping her pants and underwear down to her ankles, leaving her face down, the bottom half of her body laying completely naked and exposed. The Russian said a few words, loudly directing them at the stranger, announcing the man's new roommate. Then, to her surprise, he cut her loose as he rose to his feet. He got up, walked across the room, opened the door, and left. Beck was partially in tears now, completely confused at the transpiring events that were taking place so rapidly. She listened as she heard the Russians talking just beyond the shattered window above her head. She heard two vehicle doors slam as the sound of the engine sped off. Knowing that they were gone, she tried to gather herself together as she rose to her knees and elbows. Just then, she was forced back down to the bed, a hand forcing her head into the bare mattress. She could feel the stranger's body and instantly knew he was now completely unclothed. He reached around her waist and hefted her up as she felt his member slide between her legs. She began to shout as she tried crawling away from him. She reached up and without thinking, grabbed a piece of glass and flipped on her back and slashed the man's chest, tearing deep into his flesh. The stranger immediately lunged back and fell flat on the floor. She knew this wasn't enough to stop the assault. She followed him down to the ground, still half naked, her pants around her ankles and shoes, and landed on the man, both her knees on his stomach. She knew he probably couldn't understand her, but she didn't care. She began yelling at him anyway. She held a large piece of glass in her hand, which was causing her to bleed in the process, and put it up to his neck, piercing the man's skin once more. If you even so much as look at me here on out, it won't be your chest you'll be holding. It'll be the open sack that used to hold your testicles. The stranger, now flaccid, retracted to a pudgy, pathetic ball of whimpers and whines, pleading for his life. The three proceeded along the wash as Beck finished her story. She told them that over the next 24 hours, she didn't sleep, assuming the creep would attempt another assault. The next step was easy for her, as she befriended a maid and pleaded with her in her best Spanglish she could conjure up. As she did her best to appeal to the woman by describing her lost children, she successfully won her heart and was able to convince her to form a line of communication between her and her parted friends. This was her surest way of determining that she had the correct location of her separated team's whereabouts. I'm sorry you had to go through that, Beck. Trevor said to her with remorse in his voice. Why the hell are they arranging these bizarre forced conjugal visits anyway? Seth asked as they continued on. They were following Beck's lead this whole time assuming she knew the way. While navigating the three through the brush and focusing on the trail to be blazed ahead, she answered Seth with her only guess. Keep producing product, I suppose. Trevor added to the conversation. Sure, but who's fucking benefiting? It's not as if anyone has any money to spend, right? I mean, 
As cynical as it sounds, human trafficking makes a lot more sense when someone on the other end is paying for it. Seth's thought process quickly brought him to his best conclusion. I suppose protection and supplies could be a form of payment, right? But this reasoning simply fell flat for Trevor. Why would the Russians need to reach out for protection and supplies? There, at the top of the food chain, it makes sense for someone like Palco, or even a small cartel faction. His logical comment put the brakes on the conversation, making it hard for Seth to retort. Shh. Beck softly sounded as she put a hand up, signaling the two to quiet down and stop. We're here. They looked up over the rise of the wash to their right. There was a glow of light emanating from above. The three closed in on the dark incline and dropped to their hands and knees. They cautiously crawled up the wash's banks as a vehicle came into view. This is the exact same hill gramps Eugene and I came up when we first arrived here. Hold on a sec, Seth exclaimed in a whisper. We arrived here in crates, he said, as the three approached the top of the wash. Then he realized what she was talking about. She meant when they first arrived on the Chancellor's shores, before they had made their passage through Esmeralda's and onto Zancudo. He looked up and took in a gut-wrenching view it was the Beltran Leva complex, which was once the capital of Esmeraldas. Holy shit. Those fuckers brought us back here. He looked on and saw that they were looking at the capital building from the rear end, a view he had not yet had the opportunity to see. Trevor and Seth looked at each other as their minds began to race. They now realized they were back in the clutches of the Chancellor. Chapter 8 Retribution Part 2 It was still dark, very dark. Trevor, Beck, and Seth each had their sights locked onto a very undesirable obstacle. The retired capital of Esmeraldas, now the stronghold of the Beltrine Leva Cartel. As they studied the back side of the compound, now run by the infamous Chancellor formerly known as Lazar, and his cartel mercenaries, Seth noticed three men standing in the parking lot. 
the parking lot was vacant, other than trash piling up, and of course the vehicle they'd spotted earlier now, sitting mostly in their line of sight, obstructing a better view. It sat in front of a fence, which surrounded the compound's back entrance, but was dwarfed by the Spanish structure, which stood three stories high, with ledges on each level. This time, however, unlike their initial breach of the cartel fortress, there were no guards posted on the upper levels. Instead, in the center of the parking lot, stood three men around a bonfire, constructed from a metallic cylinder barrel. Is that who I think it is? He looked closer at the three men. The fire projected red and yellow dancing lights across their faces and bodies. Two men stood facing away from their view, while one of them stood facing toward them, opposite the two others. The three strangers formed a circle around the fire. Here and there, the man's face would come into view. And here and there, Seth's growing rage became more intense as he quickly identified the man's silver handlebar mustache. Kent, that fucking bastard. I'm gonna make that motherfucker pay. Trevor looked at Seth. We have to get out of here. We can make it to the beach easily from here. You'll have time for your revenge later. Beck nudged her brother. And then what? We'd just be stuck on an open beach, waiting for them to find us. We can swim, he said in a weakening voice, knowing how stupid his words were, but unable to take them back, as they were already out on full display. Beck gave her little brother a look that only an older sister could give, forcing him to retreat into an obedient younger sibling, awaiting her next command. No, this is our best option. It's why I brought you guys here. We did it before, we can do it again, she said. Before, we had weapons, radios, supplies. We have nothing this time. Beck rolled her eyes. Didn't you even read my letter? I have a plan. Suddenly realizing that they had just been recently rescued by her, then blindly followed her to a key escape location. It dawned on him that perhaps he should just follow her lead. Okay, so what's the plan? Beck looked back at the parking lot. See that jeep? He noticed the jeep sitting right outside the fence, on their side of it. Right on the other side of the fence, the jeep was sitting next to was a dumpster about 50 feet from Kent and his two men. Beck continued explaining her strategy. It's gotta have some weapons in it. Look at them, they're completely unarmed. We make it to that jeep, get inside without attracting their attention. Whatever is theirs becomes ours. We'll hold the advantage. Trevor looked to his sister. Yeah, but once we make a sound with any guns, we find it's over in seconds. I'm sure there's many more of his friends just inside. Beck agreed with a nod. That's why we can't let it come to that. We have to obtain any weapons in that vehicle and then sneak up on them without making a sound. Once we have them cornered with their own guns, we all know they'll agree to assist our departure. After all, they're just mercenaries, right? She then looked over to Seth. Once we have them subdued, you can have your deserved revenge. It was music to Seth's ears. I'm on board. Trevor rolled his eyes. Christ, you guys are fucking nuts. He nervously smiled while shaking his head in disbelief at the prospect of moving forward with the idea. Despite his doubts, it was him that broke their formation. All right, he said with a sigh. Let's go. He continued to confirm his alignment to the agenda as he began to crawl on his belly, beginning the long journey down the short, darkened, grassy hill. The three were now on the flat ground that followed the slight drop as they all in unison shimmied their way across the small dark field toward the jeep. Trevor was in front, Beck behind him, and finally Seth. Suddenly, without warning, they heard a loud slam of a door off into the now much closer parking lot. Trevor waved his hand back at them, keeping it low and by his side, signaling the two followers to stop. They looked on as they noticed the three in the parking lot had become two. 
Kent was now facing away from them, staring at who they now recognized as Ash. Ash opened the door and followed the other one into the building. They could only assume was Samal, the third of the Three Stooges. Trevor and his two teammates stayed extremely still as they watched the development unfold. Their hearts raced as their throats became dry with a desperate wave of anxiety. They watched as Kent turned around and started slowly walking across the parking lot, smoking a cigarette. He walked past the bonfire, raging from within its metal home, and stopped about halfway to the fence. He looked up into the night sky and paused as he took one last puff of his cigarette and flicked it far in front of him, almost reaching the fence line. Then, he turned and faced the bonfire, approached it, and placed both his hands in front of it, absorbing the heat for warmth. Now it was only Kent, and he was facing away from the three. Trevor waved his hand again, in the same exact manner as before, only this time in the opposite direction signaling the two to proceed towards the jeep. After what felt like a lifetime of sheer anxiety, the three of them finally made their way to the vehicle. They each got up in a squatting position and huddled next to the car, hiding out of view of Kent's sight. Beck signaled to the two of them to the door of the jeep. Trevor peered around the car and focused his view on Kent, while holding a fist directed behind him at the two, telling them to hold tight. Once he saw Kent, still occupied with warming himself. Unaware of the events taking place behind him, he broke his fist into a gesture that suggested moving forward with the jeep. Seth stood most of the way up, Beck still crouched to his side, and ever so gently took the door handle into his hands and slightly lifted it. A very soft, muted click sounded, letting Seth know it was unlocked and ready to be opened. He slowly and cautiously opened the door and leaned in. Trevor was still watching Kent for any hint he might turn around and blow their cover. Beck, still crouched by Seth's ankles, had no idea what either were currently observing in their individual efforts. Seth, leaning into the vehicle, reached across the seats and on the floors for anything that might feel like a weapon. Nothing, at least nothing on the front seats. He didn't want to open the back door as the front was traumatizing enough. He also didn't want to give up. He put his hand between the front driver's seat and the door frame and stretched his arm through and began feeling the back seat floors. Eureka, he felt an assault rifle. He grabbed it, feeling by memory the best place to hold it for making the least sound or God forbid, firing the thing off. Very carefully and as quietly as possible, he slowly retracted the weapon from the back seat to the open air. Beck made a motion with both her hands, suggesting he give her the weapon. He placed the gun in her hands, and she began to inspect it for ammo and functionality as quietly as she could. Seth, meanwhile, leaned back into the car to hopefully luck upon another useful item. After searching for a moment, he was unfortunate and came up short. He looked down at Beck and shrugged. Her eyes lit up as she pointed to the vehicle's open door interior. He turned and looked down at what she was pointing at, and there, in the pocket of the door, sat a large, serrated knife. He threw a wide-eyed stare and a smile right back at her. He grabbed the knife and quietly closed the door without latching it, not wanting to draw unnecessary attention their way. He crouched back down and thought to himself, it would have been better to have found another gun. He continued to contemplate in his head. This will have to work. Spending too much time on this assignment may blow their cover. If they wanted to be successful, they would have to move swiftly. There's already one man to confront now, possibly two with the potential return of Kent's cronies. Who knows who'll be joining the reunion if too much more time were to pass. Get while the getting's good. Seth finally tapped Trevor on his back, letting him know mission accomplished. Trevor shifted back on his feet, staying crouched, then tucked himself back out of sight and turned to the two. He looked at the weapons they held and nodded with content. Then he signaled for them to double back, the opposite way around the vehicle, toward its back bumper. The three, having turned their positions, now gained a new leader, Beck. 
She peered around the bumper to view Kent's activities. He still stood there, his back facing them with his hands to the fire. He was warming them up, losing himself in the flames as he was wondering what was taking Ash and Samel so long. He withdrew his hands and reached into his pockets and pulled out a pack of smokes and a match in either hand. He struck the match across the cold asphalt and began to light up another smoke, oblivious to the three behind him, darting into sight and then out of sight as they prepared to scale the fence that stood between the truck and the dumpster. His cigarette was fully lit now as he took a long first puff, when suddenly the door swung open, but it wasn't Ash and Samel. A young white male appeared, blonde hair, blue eyes and tan skin. He wore a finely trimmed beard and sported camouflage pants and a white sleeveless shirt. He was of a more slender tone than Kent, but just as tall. He carried with him a rifle, slung to his backside, and approached Kent without a word, forcing Trevor, Seth, and Beck to momentarily halt their advance, each laying as flat as possible on the darkened ground behind the dumpster and still beyond the fence. As the newly added dilemma approached Kent, they finally exchanged words. Horatio, Kent said loudly at the approaching man, cueing him to respond in kind. Hey, you guys heading out? Their conversation became lowered in volume as Horatio closed the distance between the two, making their exchange discernible for the three stalkers. It was a quick conversation as the pair promptly exchanged a tight embrace, not leaving out a few manly pats on one another's backs as if they were saying goodbye. With that, the new arrival quickly turned and walked back to the door he had emerged from, eventually opening it and disappearing into the Capitol's back entrance. Kent was alone again, taking another large puff of his cigar, while three blurry, dark silhouettes beyond him silently ascended the fence, falling behind the trash compactor one by one. As he stood there smoking, the figures emerged and slowly came into focus as they became closer to his backside. Suddenly, he dropped his smoke and raised his hands in forfeit as Seth slid a knife across his throat. Beck, now confident, walked in front of him with a condescending smirk. Trevor walked around his other side and joined Beck as she pointed the assault rifle at Kent. Kent looked at the two while holding his hands up and listened as Trevor used his own words against him. You know, Kent, one should never fall asleep on guard duty. Or, you know, smoke a cigarette while completely unarmed in the middle of a fucking parking lot. Kent stared back at the two and gave his best chuckle while his Adam's apple lay tightly under Seth's blade. There's no way out of here. You guys are so fucking dead. Beck chimed in on cue. You see, that's where you're wrong, old buddy. The three of us? She said as she eyed her two companions. We've got nothing to lose. You took our family away, carved massive holes in our legs, and left us in the middle of a fucking cartel fortress. You, on the other hand, well, that's a whole nother story, isn't it? You've got quite a lot to lose, and I think your friend there might start with that pretty little throat of yours. So, if you don't do exactly what we say, when we say it, we're gonna turn your insides out and force them down your fucking throat. She gave him a flirty little smile and a wink to sum up her proposal. Kent took a hearty gulp. Just then, they heard the door behind them swing open, accompanied by laughter. Beck and Trevor swung around as Beck pointed her gun towards the threat. Ash and Samel stopped dead in their tracks. They each dropped the cans they were eating out of and the spoons they were eating them with and raised their hands. Trevor looked at the pair, caught off their guards, and signaled for them to join Kent. We've been waiting for you guys. Why don't you join your friend, Kent, over there? Get warm by the fire. The pair cautiously moved over near Kent, their hands over their heads, attempting not to escalate things any further. Trevor, check them out. Beck ordered. Trevor walked up to them and began going through all their pockets. Not much was found, 
chewing tobacco, cigarettes, matches, and whatnot. Then Trevor happily sounded off. Look what we have here. He dangled a pair of keys in front of Kent's face, which he had just removed from his pockets. They were the keys to the nearby Jeep. Tell me where the kids are, Beck said in a much lower and more deliberate voice. Kent laughed, making Samel and Ash uneasy. They didn't want to die tonight over Kent's hubris. Beck continued on. Seth. Seth slid the knife deeper into Kent's throat as blood began to drip from the serrated edges. Okay, Kent said in immediate response to the fatal threat. They're safe. They're in a town nine miles southwest of here. Vuelta Larga. The Russians swap the kids from town to town. They call it crossbreeding. And Anne, she sternly requested. Seth kept digging the knife deeper into Kent's throat, giving him some encouragement to answer his interrogator's line of questioning. Kent, under duress, frantically continued. At the Esmeralda airport, probably in one of the hangars. They turned them into some kind of medieval hospitals. They force feed hostages there. Intravenously, they call it a feedlot. They have a lot of them. The Russians' clients are sickles. Nobody knows what they're up to, but they are very well equipped. That's why the Russians work for them. They were very prepared when shit went sideways across the globe. They supply the entire program here and everywhere. In return, the Russians are supplied, as well as the cartels. But they're fucking diabolical. Any cartel anywhere pale in comparison to the Russians' clients' agendas. It's like they're herding and raising humans as fucking cattle. What do you mean, cattle? Beck questioned. With that, Kent just rolled his eyes and repeated the certainty he felt would be the three's fate. What the fuck does it matter? As soon as you leave here, they will find you. And when they do, they will kill you, he said causing Beck to nod at Seth as he obliged by piercing Kent's neck once more with his blade. Now, with his shirt slowly being drenched in his own blood, Kent quickly answered her question, achieving a reprieve from the knife's edge as Seth loosened his grip, allowing their hostage to speak clearly. That's why they feed and house you fuckers. It's why they give you clean toilet paper. They want their cattle to be more pure or some shit. They've got an endless supply chain of goods to take care of their product and to pay their mercenaries. How do you think these motherfuckers all around us have plenty of ammo and guns after all these years? How about that cigarette I just smoked? We're not the ones you guys should be angry with. It's these fucking clients that the Russians have. You see, we're just like you. We're in this shit show, too. He then chuckled and looked at Beck and Trevor with an antagonistic grin. We're just smarter than you and much higher on the food chain, he said as Seth clamped down harder on his throat with the blade of his knife, causing Kent to grit his teeth and shut his eyes as he let out a slight grunt. Beck smiled. Was that so hard? She looked at Seth and nodded. Seth eased off the knife slightly, but kept it firmly on his throat. Then Beck looked at the keys in Trevor's hands. Well, Kent, I'm sorry. I know this is anticlimactic, but we just really must be going. And as we learned our lessons, you most graciously taught us, we just can't afford to leave any loose ends. Ash and Samel looked at their boss, then back at each other, their hearts beginning to race as Beck's ominous tone echoed in their ears. It was a beautiful sunrise over the sandy beaches of Esmeralda. The jungles swayed with the wind as they performed their ritual morning ballet of fluttering leaves. A beautiful capital basked in the early dawn, gowned in its Spanish colonial style architecture. Just within its walls, a large bedroom suite dominated the layout of the top floor. 
Just then, there was a loud knock at the beautiful interior doors, separating the bedroom from the halls. The doors burst open. It was Santiago and Nicholas, generals of the Beltran Labor Cartel. Senor, please, you must come with us, exclaimed Nicholas. The back doors to the capital, leading to the vacant parking lot, flew open. The Chancellor walked out with a fast pace, still arranging his sports coat and tie. His brothers followed closely behind him. He squinted his eyes, shielding them from the sunlight. He peered off into the distance as a look of anger spread across his face. He gazed upon the sight at the top of a grassy hill just outside the fence. There, among the trees, hung three men, Kent, Ash, and Samel. Kent was hanging in the middle, his abdomen sliced open, his bowels spilling out, covering the grassy earth below. <laughs>